appreciate you joining me again today for our weekly PPACA webinars. Um, yeah, I mean, we have a, con consistently have a lot to talk about. And again, we have a pretty full agenda. Some of these agenda items um, you're going to find that we're going to have to review over and over again because they're a bit convoluted and a little bit hard to understand, at least from my perspective. Um, the first bullet point we're going to talk about today, and oh, just to back up, if you do have any questions that you want to you know, ask at least during the webinar or you have a, a question already, um, on your control panel you can just type those in. Uh, on the question panel, and we'll get to those at the end. And, uh, you know, again, these are designed so that we can all learn from each other, and no question is uh, too ridiculous for me to answer. So <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, so on to our first agenda item. Uh, the COBRA extension, the special election, the special circumstances election period for those that are currently on COBRA is coming to an end on July 1st. So that's, you know, of course, Tuesday. Um, so you're going to want to certainly reach out to, again, to any of your employer clients or any clients that you have that may be on COBRA because the special election period for the participants that are on COBRA to give them the ability to voluntarily waive off their COBRA or turn, terminate their COBRA and get uh, subsidized or unsubsidized coverage on the individual side is coming to an end again on 7-1. If you have somebody that falls within these guidelines, they have to go through the FFM whether they qualify for a subsidy or not in order to get this special circumstances exception uh, period. So I just want to throw that out there because when we talk next week it will have come and gone. So last, uh, last opportunity to push for those those clients. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about <laughs> MLR rebates. And last, last week we, we talked or I mentioned that um, uh, Aetna and Health America were releasing um, or notified us that they will have MLR rebates coming out and um, they will be sent by August 1st. And I mentioned that we would talk briefly about what can be done with those MLR rebates. So first, if on the individual side, that's all to the employee or to the, the individual that was paying the premium. That's no question. Um, but it gets a little bit uh, dicey when you talk about the employers and how they have to handle it. This uh, document will actually be in next week's newsletter. Um, I didn't get it in in time for this week, so um, you know, again, you can you can follow up next week with it. But I wanted to draw your attention to a few items in this. Um, it talks about how an employer should handle any MLR rebate received from an insurer, and that they say that it depends on on the type of group health plan. Uh, they mention either ERISA, non-federal government group health plan, or non-ERISA, or non-governmental plan, and whether the rebate is considered a plan asset. Any rebate amount that qualifies as a plan asset under ERISA must be used for the exclusive benefit of the plan's participants and beneficiaries. So that seems, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, identi identity of the policy holder holder and source of the premiums is going to be key, and um, it goes on to say if the plan is considered a trust, then of course the policy is an asset of the plan and the entire rebate must be treated as a plan asset, so it stays within the trust. That's, you know, that's pretty straightforward, and I don't know how many uh, groups out there really fall within that category. If an employer pays 100% of the premiums, then the rebate is not a plan asset and the employer can retain the entire rebate amount. If the participant uh, paid 100% of the premiums or if premiums were paid partly by the employer and partly by the participant, then the percentage of the rebate equal to the percentage of the cost paid by the participants, the employees, um, is considered a plan asset. So, you know, that could be distributed to the part, uh, participants, um, fair and objectively, they're talking about. And um, if 
distributing payments to the participants is not cost effective uh, because the amounts are small or would give rise to tax consequences, then the employer can use them in a different way. They can use them towards the cost of future uh, premiums or toward benefit enhancements, increasing the benefits, using that, that lump sum to say, well, for the next year, we're going to buy up the plan because we have this, this uh, pocket of money. Um, I don't expect that the rebates are going to be that substantial that, you know, you can buy up and, and you know, any of that, but uh, it is just worth noting. Um, once the rebates are released, you have three months from the receipt to distribute those accordingly. And um, it also goes on to talk about the tax consequences. And sorry if I'm going too fast, but again, you're going to have access to this information. And what they're saying, if, if the premiums were paid by employees on an after-tax basis, then the rebate will generally not be taxable because it's already been taxed. Um, if premiums were paid by employees on a pre-tax basis under a cafeteria plan, the rebate will generally be taxable income to employees in the current year and will be subject to the employment taxes. So again, there are a lot of things that are required of us now as licensed producers. Um, and I guess part of it is becoming a, a quasi-tax advisor. But I wanted to at least let you know about this. Um, because I said I would last week, and again, it's going to be in the newsletter. Um, we do have some time. It is only the end of June, so August 1st is when the, the MLRs will be distributed, so we do have some time to wrap our hands around it. So back to the agenda. If that's not confusing enough, the MLR rebates and what employers can do with them, um, yesterday there was new guidance on the 90-day wait and orientation period for small employers and mid-sized employers. And, you know, again, it's so convoluted, it's almost comical. Um, I'm going to have this information again in next week's newsletter, but for, for groups, an employer cannot offer more than a 90 calendar, de calendar year wait from the time that the employee is eligible to get on their group health plan. So I think that's pretty straightforward. We all understand that. It's not a 90-day as in three months. It's 90 calendar days. All days are covered. Um, so typically what employers are doing is saying that their employees, new hires, are eligible for, the fir for coverage the first of the month following 60-day wait. That way it kind of stays on a first of the month basis and it doesn't exceed that 90 calendar year wait. But what HHS has um, actually come out with is allowing for a, an orientation period prior to that 90-day wait. And the way they describe it is the orientation measurement period is one month, not 30 or 31 days, and a month is measured by adding one calendar month and subtracting one calendar day from an employee's start date when they are eligible for coverage. Um, the 90-day wait can only start that has to start the first day after that 30-day orientation period. And they give an example by saying if an employee start date in an otherwise eligible position is October 16th, the orientation period could not extend beyond November 15th. So again, that's 30 days minus one calendar day. And coverage would have to begin February 14th, which is the 91st day after the start of the 90-day wait period, which is the day after the 30-day orientation period. So easy, right? <laughs> yeah, trust me. I, I uh, laugh at these things just because I just have no clue how these people come up with, with these rules. But um, it is our, our livelihood now, and uh, I guess we just need to embrace it and uh, learn all the convoluted details, the good, the bad, the ugly. So um, again, this information will be in next week's uh, HDR newsletter, so you'll have time to look at that. Um, just a reminder on to our next bullet point, we are running our, our uh, federally facilitated marketplace certification support sessions again. They are starting on August 7th. Uh, we have eight sessions scheduled. 
Um, all of the sessions will be here at URL, except for uh, three of them. I will have one in Pittsburgh, one in the Philadelphia, King of Prussia area, and then uh, one in Wilkes-Barre. So um, watch for dates and times and sign up if you'd like. Um, the 2015 modules will be available in July. Um, again, I'm not sure when in July, so if you feel the need to go back in and you want to do it on your, your own, please, please do so. Um, I would say if you want to wait for our support sessions, then what you should do in the meantime, as I mentioned last week, is log on to the Marketplace Learning Network, make sure that your username and password are still you know, still working, at, because if you come to the session and you don't have access to your site, you can't, you're, you're not going to be able to complete your modules. So you do have some time to get your username and password in, uh, remembered <laughs> and uh, sent to you if you can't remember it. And, um, you know, when you log in, you can also check that your national producer number is accurate and uh, that you are registered as an agent broker for individual and shop. So, um, you know, again, just a reminder, more information will be coming on that. More tax forms, um, tax forms 6056 and 6055. Um, these forms will be required by employers um, to report the terms and conditions of the health care that's provided to their full-time employees. 6056 is what most will use, most employers, because um, it's fully insured groups, um, as well as self-insured plans. And that's going to, you're going to need the name and address and employee, employer identification number, um, verifying that the employer offers minimum essential coverage, the number of full-time employees for each month, um, the, you know, for each full-time employee, the number of months coverage was provided, employee share of the premium, uh, a name and address of taxpayer ID number of the employee. And then, of course, the 6055 would be for employers with only self-insured plans, and the additional information would be needed. Now, they say that they expect the first reporting will be due February of 2017 for the 2016 calendar year. Um, you know, you can take this with a grain of salt. The IRS encourages an adopting, <clears throat> pardon me, one year early to test reporting systems and plan design. Um, quite frankly, I don't think that's our responsibility, but I do think it's our responsibility to let our employer clients know that this is coming up and that there will be forms required. Again, it just, you know, really shows the value add that you're bringing to the table um, by notifying your employer clients or new employer clients um, of these, these new forms. Um, let me go back to... To the next bullet point, which is same-sex marriages. As many of you know, PA um, now has adopted the same-sex marriage provision. Um, the governor did not do anything to um, thwart the, the law that is in place. So carriers now are, are working to release uh, the procedures for same-sex marriages. Um, essentially, the same-sex marriages um, will be allowed for individual and group, and it's going to work like any other qualifying event where, you know, they're newly married and they can be added. Um, so, again, more, more is coming on that, but I just wanted to let you know that it is, it is available and uh, the carriers are going to obviously and clearly adhere to the law. Next bullet point is Coventry, a.k.a. Health America One and Aetna. Uh, for 2015, of course, we know that Aetna has purchased Coventry, and uh, actually a, a, quite a while ago. And for 2014, they took the stance of marketing their programs uh, independent of each other. There's Aetna paper uh, for the, the five-county Philadelphia area plus Lehigh and Northampton counties, and then Health America One, one operates in the other 60 counties. Um, that is not going to change for 2015. Coventry will still be in the 60 counties that they're currently in, and Aetna will be in the same seven counties that they're in currently. Uh, so that's news, such as it is. At least it's news. Um, the Cap Blue Cross individual, 
um, this is really the only carrier that has, for 2014, uh, come to market with different plans in the exchange versus outside, but for 2015, they're going to streamline it, and they are going to have the same product in the exchange as outside, so it's going to be much more, I think, consumer and agent friendly to explain the plan provision. They're also planning on being very, very competitive for 2015, so I'm anxious to see how that comes to grips fruition. Um, I wanted to let you know that we are holding a webinar, I'm sorry, a seminar, an actual seminar. The date set for that is October 29th, which is really going to be good timing because of the opening of the uh, 2015 enrollment starting 11-15. So it's going to be timely two weeks before the start, so hopefully it will be valuable to you and we'll get some good product information and a head, head start on uh, marketing for our clients for 2015. Um, the Central Penn Business Journal Healthcare Symposium, a lot of you did request tickets. I don't have any more free tickets available, so thank you for, uh, for being willing to sit in the audience and certainly learn something, but uh, for the, the few minutes that I'm on to be a friendly face that I, I look out at, so I, I appreciate that. If you do want to register, um, that information is in our newsletter. So uh, again, I don't have free tickets, but you can certainly register and uh, attend uh, because I think it would be beneficial to you. Uh, the commissioner, um, Pennsylvania Insurance Commissioner, is going to be speaking as well as Capital Blue Cross and um, Highmark and a few other uh, vendors. So I think it's probably a good a good place to be on July 25th. So. Um, at this point, that's about it on my agenda. Um, there are some questions, so let me get right to those. And as we're answering those questions, if you have additional questions, again, go ahead and type them in. Um, Andrea says, can you please repeat the calculation and definition of the orientation period? Um, does the waiting period take place after the orientation period? How does the employer include this verbiage in their employee handbook? Um, well, it, yeah, I understand your questions, and what I can tell you is that employers, I, I'm not sure how they would handle that in their employee handbook, so I can just tell you that right off the bat, other than just maybe mentioning that there is an orientation period, and that orientation period is 30 days, at which point the day after they would start their 90-day wait and be eligible for, for group health insurance. And essentially how it does work is that if an employee is hired and the job requires um, an orientation period and the date of hire, they, they, the employer has to um, do one month minus one day, which essentially is 30 calendar days um, for the orientation period. The 31st day would be the start of the 90-day wait period to be eligible to get on to the employer group health plan. Now, employers don't necessarily have to adopt a 90-day wait period, but they can't exceed that 90-day wait period. So that 30-day orientation, if it applies, plus you know any waiting period, uh, the waiting period would start after the orientation period. Yeah. A little bit convoluted, but um, if you have additional questions, Andrea, you can certainly give me a call. And does the 90-day period apply to all employer-provided coverage? It does. Is the seminar on all plans or just CBC? Uh, Darcy asked those questions, and the seminar that I'm having on October 29th is only for Cap Blue Cross. I will be offering um, other seminars for other carriers. Um, it's just that Capital is the only one I have set up at this point. I'm still working on dates uh, and times for the others. Greg asks, if you are not writing any subsidized or exchange business, do you have to do the FSM training? You absolutely do not. If you have no desire, no clients that would fall into these categories, and just un an unwillingness to even deal with healthcare.gov, <laughs> you do not have to do the FSM certification. Um, you would still be eligible by virtue of your contract um, with the insurance carrier to sell outside the exchange for the enrollment period, but nothing on. So, no, it's voluntary. 
Um, Karen says, is there a specific group size employer that needs to complete the 6056 or 6055, or is it for all size employers? I believe it is for all size employers, um, but I can verify that, Karen, and I will follow up with everyone um, next week with an answer, and then for Karen, I will follow up with you as soon as I verify that. I believe it is for all employer sizes. Uh, but again, we'll verify. So it looks like that's uh, all the questions I have right now. If you have a few minute, a uh, few last minute questions and want to um, ask those, go right ahead. Um, just uh, to mention, next the next webinar is Thursday, July 3rd. So the day before Independence Day, our office is closed Friday the 4th. Hopefully you are uh, going to be out enjoying the weather and the holiday and not thinking about Pipaca, but if you want to start that vacation or long weekend early and tune in, you go right ahead. Uh, you know, again, Thursday, July 3rd, 9.30. And uh, that actually concludes the webinar because I don't have any more questions. And as always, I appreciate your business, appreciate the time that you take each week, and uh, I hope you have a great balance of the week and a great weekend. Bye-bye.